of Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. And as we're doing pre-lockout, we're continuing to go through all of the teams and the farm systems. And I figured what way, what better way to honor the world champion Atlanta Braves than to bring on the host of Locked On Braves, Jake Mastriani. Welcome to the show. Excited to have you personally for me as an Atlanta fan thrilled that you're here yeah thanks for having me on Lindsay. like i said uh and we actually had a uh a listener to the show re- request this so i uh, appreciate that and i'm glad to be on here to talk some braves baseball for sure after the exciting season and i've had nothing else to do this off season but dive into <laughs> prospects so uh, i'm really excited to have this conversation absolutely and yeah the the listener tweeted the two of us and said hey I want a podcast where you guys talk about how the Braves use the farm system to win a championship. So, I mean, let's go ahead and let's absolutely do that. And obviously Braves beat the Astros in five games, wonderful series. I actually was lucky enough to go to game three. Um, First time I've ever been to a world series game in my life memory. I will never forget. Uh, But when you look at how we constructed the roster for the world series, everybody thinks about the outfielders, how you retooled the outfield on the fly with a bunch of trades, but a good number of those position players that the Braves used um, in the world series were guys that came through their farm system, whether it was um, through international free agency in the case of Ozzy Albies or a guy they drafted like, like Austin Riley or somebody who they got as a minor leaguer and then brought them to Atlanta, like Dansby Swanson. Yeah. And, you know, there's this it almost gets overshadowed because of how good the trades were and how good Solaire and Peterson and Duvall um, and Rosario were, you know, down the second half in the regular season when the Braves took over first place. And obviously in the postseason, it almost gets overshadowed how good the core of the Braves was down the stretch. You know, Austin Riley, you know, having MVP type season, Freddie Freeman just taking off, you know, Dansby Swanson with the home runs, Ozzy Albies getting going. I mean, yes, the the trade deadline moves got them over the hump, but it was still those core pieces that the Braves, you know, acquired and built for this championship run, you know, that did a lot of the work as well in that second half, getting them into the postseason and then helping them succeed in the postseason as well. But, you know, you're right. I mean, this was this was what all those lean years were for to build a team like this, to have a core like this, where you can go out and make a a move at the postseason to plug some holes, but you still had that core there. You still had your Freeman, your Riley, your, your Albies, your Swanson, your Max Fried, you know, your Ian Anderson's. I mean, those were the core of this team and Rosario and Soler and Duvall, you know, they just helped put them over the top and in a great way in great fashion. Uh, Maybe one you couldn't even really imagine, but, um, but that core, like you talked about, that they built through the rebuild, I mean, that is still what put this team in a position to win a World Series. Absolutely. And and being st- strategic with the deals that you make and, and when to sell on a prospect and when to buy on a prospect, we saw some of the trades. The Aaron Blair trade is one that stands out in my mind just so strongly to me where you you send Aaron Blair – to Arizona, you get Dansby Swanson, you get Ender Enciarte, who who carries you for a few years leading up to this World Series championship. And that's that's kind of the hard thing to judge. And that, that's that's where a lot of organizations I feel like struggle is knowing when to go in, trade a prospect versus when to hold them. And that's the question we're gonna have to answer about some of the guys that we have in in, in AAA now is should we have traded any of these guys or should we trade them now to go get pieces to try to keep this team together and make another run? Uh, yeah. And I think that was, was the Chevy Miller trade too, right? Where they got Chubby. Dansby and, and Ender um, and that group. And you know, that was really, you know, when things started to kind of kind of turn around, but to your point, you know, Braves fans have been, you know, 
on Alex Antopoulos because he hasn't really made a big prospect trade, you know, and some of these players have lost some of that value where maybe you could have made a big move. Now it didn't matter. They still won a world series. So all of that is forgiven, but you still kind of were just waiting for, you know, Alex to, to trade a But to your point, the, the people that other teams were asking for in trade talks, they were Ozzy Albies. They were Austin Riley. You know, they were Ronald Acuna jr. So, you know, you have to kind of tip your hat to the front office to not give in and trade those really big pieces to try to, you know, maybe get a big established, you know, name a big leaguer. But they held on to those prospects and hold on to those players. And that's what, you know, built this team. Absolutely. And just a small little almost side note here, but. Is there a specific move that that was proposed in the last couple of years that you think would have been a good decision for the Braves to do that they didn't? You know, because you you've seen some of the things out there about this guy's available, that guy's available, and there's always been proposals. Oh, the Braves could go out and get a guy. Um, and kind of looking back, and I I understand you have the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of well, we won a championship with this group of guys, but when I go back and think about it, a lot of those proposed deals. I don't think any of them, like, I don't think there's any of them I would go back and take necessarily and say, yes, I would ship out uh, an Austin Riley for a, for a, a Chris Bryant, for instance, or some of those rumored deals. I can't think of any of those that I would go ahead right now and say they were wrong to not accept that. It feels like everything broke perfectly for Atlanta. Yeah, there's not a ton that come to mind off the bat for me. One is JT Real Muto, which I know everybody was really high on that happening. I believe they wanted Austin Riley in that deal, maybe some others. And, you know, like the way the Braves have handled the catcher position really for years now, whether you go back to Kurt Suzuki and Tyler Flowers tandem, and now to Travis, you know, Darno, and now bringing in Manny Pena to be with him as well. Obviously they got some young catchers, which I'm sure we'll talk about later coming up, but they really handled that catcher position position really well. Um, so I was okay with not doing that deal. The one that I could kind of just think of at the top of my head was in 2020. I really wanted them to trade for Mike Clevenger. I really thought they needed, you know, another frontline starter to get them over the hump last year. Didn't happen. You know, ends up being a good thing, I guess, because Clevenger, you know, obviously injured, missed the rest of that year and and this season as well, which, you know, that's just what it is with pitchers. You take that risk. But that was one move I thought. I really wanted the Braves to to go all in and kind of make that deal because I thought they could have, and, and very well they could have, even without him, won the World Series in 2020. But I thought that was a move that they probably needed to make and probably could have. It's hard to say should have because we know how it's played out, like you said, in hindsight. But that's the one move I can think of where I was really you know, wanting the Braves to go out and Alex go all in to get that frontline starting pitcher that that 2020 team needed. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, the the Braves model seems to be building the roster from mostly homegrown talent, and international free agents and supplementing with a either a, a veteran on a one year kind of prove it deal or spending money on multiple years of a veteran like a I think a Charlie Morton extension. I think the Marcelo Zuna re-signing you, you bring a guy in for a year if it works out great you have the option to sign them but for the most part the Braves kind of want to stick with that homegrown core and the question for me now is as as these guys get closer to free agency Dansby Swanson has one year left things like that uh, what decisions are made who is retained who moves on and I think that whole that all kind of comes back to I'm sure you've talked about it plenty this offseason the Freddie Freeman situation of how do you do you bring back Freddie Freeman how do you replace him if you don't and uh as a prospect guy, I look at the farm system and I think there's not a lot of corner infield talent for Atlanta. And so that's something that I worry about if you don't bring back Freeman. But what are your thoughts on the Braves' chosen method to build the roster? Is it Have they been too protective of these prospects or are they kind of striking the right balance between prospects and free agents? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that they are trying to avoid any long-term big deals that could potentially cripple the franchise. I mean, when you are deliberating this hard over bringing back your franchise player, 
that tells you how much this this front office does not want to get into any dead contract deals. You know, you go back a couple off seasons ago with Josh Donaldson, and you know they really wanted him back. Braves fans wanted him back. They weren't willing to go to what the Twins went to to, to bring him back. And there was a number Alex had in mind. He wasn't going to go over it. And I think Josh wanted to come back. Um, and then the Marcelo Zuna signing even, they waited on that. I, I think they wanted to explore all other options. I don't really think Alex wanted to do that deal, but there was nothing else out there he could get that was going to replace that. And so he had to go back to Ozuna and give him that deal, which – in my mind, I didn't love now, and I really don't love it now at this point. But, you know, that's just how much they are trying to avoid four or five-year deals um, with big AAVs like that because they know how crushing that can be to a franchise. So, for me, they are really smart with their money in, in trying to, you know, like you said, have an influx of prospects coming up, you know, and then just kind of supplement that with you know guys on those one-year deals like we've seen with, with Charlie Morton and Donaldson and Ozuna in the past. So, look, it's worked. You know, they've gotten to the postseason four straight years. They've won a World Series, so it's worked. You know, as a fan, it's just like give them all the money and, and, and trade all yeah. the prospects. But, you know, it's definitely a good formula, even though it's frustrating from a fan's perspective at time, I think. But, hey, you, you got to trust Alex at this point. I mean, he's done nothing but but – and gender, I mean, he, he's earned all of the goodwill just based on the moves at the trade deadline. I remember the conversations about the Braves should sell at the trade deadline. The Braves should go ahead, you know, get rid of some pieces, let some guys go uh, and regroup for next year. And I'm kind of glad he didn't do that. And he didn't say, we're going to do a, a whole new fresh start for 22. We're going to punt this season. Um, but speaking of new starts and new years, it is the new year. And that means new year's resolutions. And if yours is getting fit, eating healthier, make sure you include a Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, uh, prob probably even better than a candy bar, covered in 100% real chocolate, 130 calories, 17 grams of protein. So my idea is go to all the places you stash candy bars in your life. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's your office. Maybe it's you know it's your pantry. Throw out all the candy bars, replace them with Built Bars. They've got tons of flavors to choose from, peanut butter brownie, raspberry cookies and cream, are some of the ones in rotation and they have limited time flavors as well. So you could go to built.com, check out the list, see what's new while you're there. Use promo code locked 15 for 15% off your order at built.com. That's promo code locked 15 at built.com. So you mentioned these three guys earlier and I kind of want to come back to, or you mentioned some of them, but Christian Pache, Drew Waters uh, and Michael Harris. These are kind of the big three outfield prospects for Atlanta. We always talked about the big two, and now it's the big three. And there's a lot of questions around baseball about what should the Braves do with these guys and what are they going to become? If you look at the 2020 season, the thought going into 2020 is that Christian Pache is possibly a generational talent. Uh, and then when he played in the, in the NLCS, you said, okay, he's ready for the stage. He's ready for the show. And then his start to the year in 2021 offensively was, was pretty dreadful. And I think there's a big question now. What can Christian Pache be? What is his ceiling as a major leaguer given his offensive struggles? Yeah, look, and his defense honestly wasn't fantastic in the big leagues. Obviously, he had some injuries there. I don't foresee that being a problem going forward but uh, he's had a trouble adjusting and to be fair you know thrown into the fire in the NLCS and then things just didn't get off to a great start in 2021 then he had the injuries um he was really good in the second half of 2021 though I'm really I'm really looking forward to look I, I've gone on record on the podcast saying you know I'm fine with him starting the year as the brave center fielder if they can't find you know anything out there this offseason to potentially upgrade i want to see what he can do and, and he's still really young i think you know people forget that him and drew waters both still really young but you know look if pache can play gold glove defense and i believe he can and will we just need him to hit 250 260 15 home runs you know 15 to 20 home runs i, I don't think you need a ton from him offensively if he's going to be that gold glove defender. So 
Look, I, I still believe in Pache. I believe he can be a very good major league center fielder for a long time uh, with the Braves. Um, but there are definitely some question marks with that bat if it will ever come around. You know, I don't ever see him being a perennial 20 plus home run hitter. But again, if he can get 15 to 20, you know, still 15 to 20 bags, hit 260, 270, hitting seventh or eighth in the order and play gold glove defense. I mean, you can live with that knowing you got Ronald Acuna, Ozzy, Ozzy Albies, Freddie Freeman, hopefully, uh, you know, in the middle of that order. So, you know, you can live with that from Pache if he's going to give you that elite gold glove defense. Yeah, and, you know, elite defender, uh, good base zone ability, ability to get on base. I mean, really what you need from Christian Pache is you need peak ender, peak ender in Ziarte. Mm. You need Christian Pache yeah. to be – the the 200 hits of Ender Enciarte. And with that, you're happy. I mean, he's got double plus speed. He's probably one of your fastest base runners in the system. Obviously has the best outfield arm and the best outfield defense. And so, you know, the defense, when he's healthy, the defense is electric. And like you said, it's it, it doesn't take much offensively. I really, he's a guy that I feel like Missing the 2020 or the the 29 the yeah the, the 2020 minor league season, having alternate site work but not having you know games to play every day. I feel like he's a guy who kind of got hurt. The guy that is trying to refine his technique and figure out exactly the right um, hand set and the you know the right swing to make him successful. He's a guy that was really hurt and. I hope that the lockout doesn't drag on too long because I think if he can get a good start in spring training, he can hit, get some early hits, hit well. I think that'll portend well for how, you know, for giving him the confidence going into 22. And like talking about confidence, that's a thing that Drew Waters has in spades, but we haven't necessarily seen that confidence. Uh, translate to offensive performance from him in the minor leagues yeah and like i said it a minute ago pache and water still really young even for the triple a yeah. level you know I, again i've never been the biggest drew waters fan I, i've watched him a couple of times in person that swing that approach you know it's going to lead to a lot of strikeouts however i still think he's the better upside player of the two because I think he has the potential to be a 20-plus home run hitter, a 2020 player, and maybe not gold glove defense, but I, I definitely think he's an above-average defender. So for me, you know, Drew Waters is, still has the higher upside of the two because I think he could potentially hit at the top of a, of a lineup and give you some speed power threat up there and be a really good defender. But, you know, he's he's got to figure out. He's got to cut down on the strikeouts, which he's getting better at. He just has to have a better approach at the plate. I mean, the games I've gone back and watched of him this offseason, it's like he gets in the box with an 0-2 count. You know, it's it's almost Jeff, Jeff Francorish, um, the way he kind of just steps in there and is just swinging at every – Ozzie Albie-ish. I mean, let, let's, let's you know, say it. You know, Ozzie Albies goes up there with an 0-2 count sometimes because he just swings at whatever – it works for him. You know, maybe it'll work for, for Drew Waters one day, but he's just, he's got to find a better approach at the plate. He's got to cut down on his swing a little bit to avoid all the strikeouts, but the, the talent is there, you know, that made him a top 20, 30 prospect, you know, however high he was. So I still believe there's a ton of upside with Drew Waters. 2022 is going to be a big year for him. He's obviously going to go back to AAA, got some things to figure out, but, it, you know, I still think the, the kid can be a very good player. I also think if somebody's going to get traded out of the, the three that you mentioned, I think it is Drew Waters. Um, just because if I'm another team, I'm seeing the same thing, and I'm thinking Waters has the biggest upside right now. You know, Maybe Harris does eventually, but I still think Waters has that value at the moment that would be enticing to other teams in trade talks. Yeah, and – He's a guy that he struck he struck out 36% of the time in 2019. He got that down to 30, 31% in 2021. And he got it down to 22% at the end of uh 2021, like by the end of the season there. So he's making gradual improvement. But I think the question is, like you said, can it stick? And like when he eventually bumps up a level of competition, is are those problems going to come back? I mean, if you're 
if you're swinging at sliders down and away in AAA, what are you going to do when you're facing Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer for a series? We, or, you know, and so, you know, say it's one Alcantara of those things too, there. like Austin Riley. I mean, he has had to make adjustments. He is still adjusting. I could see it being a situation where, you know, maybe Waters kind of starts to get to click at AAA and gets to the majors and he's going to have to adjust again. And how long does that adjustment period take? Because I think that's where he's at now. He, he's facing major league pitching at the AAA level for the most part. And he's trying to adjust to that. He's going to have to adjust again once he gets to the big leagues, you know. And that's 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 everything with these young prospects is once they get up there, how quickly can they adjust? Because the league is going to adjust to them. We saw it with Austin Riley came up on fire. The league adjusted, and it's taken him, you know, year year and a half to to adjust back. So, you know, that's the thing with Waters. I think you're just going to have to be patient. Again, I think the talent is there, but it's clearly, you know, taking him a while to kind of figure it out, that approach, you know, at the the major league level or the minor, the higher minor league levels. Yeah, and and talking about guys that that have the right approach and have the right mindset, Michael Harris, uh, new number one overall prospect in the Braves system, and he he really feels like he's the best pure hitter in the system. And it's funny because a lot of scouts back in 2019 wanted him as a pitcher. As a left-handed pitcher, he would hit 93 on his fastball, had a good-looking curveball, but the Braves said, no, we're taking the third round as an outfielder. And now we're talking about, you know, a, a, a switch hitter. I think he's still a switch hitter. He, bat, he batted almost exclusively left-handed last year. Has he officially dropped the switch hitting, or is that just a, a thing? Well, I, all, as far as I know, he's just a left-handed hitter now. I, I haven't okay. seen him listed as a switch anywhere. Okay, so he, he has just gone to left – to lefty now he's a guy where he only hit seven home runs and and i think some of that is just the physical development he's even younger than than pache and waters i mean he's born in 2001 so he's a younger guy and as he fills out i think that power is going to come um but he he definitely does a great job at being aggressive when he needs to and and making sure that he's getting good pitches to hit and it's a it's a talent that one, I wish he could just teach it to Waters, to, to Drew Waters. <laughs> right. But then also, it's a sign of maturity for an offensive approach that not a lot of guys at the lower levels of the minor leagues really have at this point in their careers. Yeah, look, I, I'm the hype has almost gone too much <laughs> on mm-hmm. on uh, on Michael Harris at this point, but it's it's warranted. And um, look, I was all over him going into the the 2021 season. I, I love the kid. Nothing I've watched this offseason has changed that opinion. I do love him, um, but the hype is almost getting a, a little too too much at the moment. But you're right about the approach. I mean, every game I went back and watched of him, you know, it was just like it was a battle for the pitcher at the plate. And you love to see that. Again, he was considered kind of just a raw athlete coming out of high school and to just already have that approach and mindset at the plate. You just hope that continues as he gets up into the higher levels. But uh, again, went back and watched some of his games this off season, just blown away. I mean, the average started to, to fall in the second half. And so I was curious mm-hmm. and that's where I was watching games in the second half. And look, every game I watched, he was hitting lasers just right at people. It was just a little bit of a bad, you know, unluck that he was having at the end. He was still hitting the balls hard, putting the ball in play, not striking out a ton. Uh, just the luck wasn't so much on his side there, and at least the games you know that I watched. So uh, I really love this kid, but you're absolutely right about the approach. It is it is already a mature approach. Again, have to see how that continues as he likely will start 2022 at Double A, which is a big jump for minor league prospects, as you know. So uh, going to be a big year for him in 2022. If he excels at that level, uh, then the hype train will really be coming through at that point. But the power is the one thing. You know, he can be a five-tool player. Right now he's a four-tool tool player until he proves, you know, he can be a, a 15, 20 home run hitter. And we just haven't seen that right now. And A South is not a great place to prove that. That's a really tough league to hit home runs in. So mm-hmm. I, I still would like to see him get close to 15 home runs. If he did that, look, my, my hype level would be uh, through, through the roof. So that's what I'm looking for, for him this year, obviously to show some more of that power. 
And again, the games I've watched, there was a lot of balls that he stung and they just died at the warning track. You know, I don't know that that high level ballparks as much as I do the double A South ballparks. So maybe that's a factor, but I also just think there's a, a another just little thing I saw in his swing is he he wasn't getting to his lower half as much. And, you know, obviously, if he starts to, to figure that out a little bit, I think that's going to help generate some more power. But he also just sprays the ball everywhere. I mean, a lot of hits were just, you know, left center field, just rockets that were coming off the bat. So I, I love the kid. I love his swing. I love, you know, his presence in the box. You know, he, he carries himself like a big leaguer already. So I'm really impressed with Michael Harris. Can't wait to see what, what he does. Yeah, the the interesting thing I noticed about his home runs is, Every one of his home runs, all seven of them, were on the road. And so I definitely do think there's a ballpark factor there. But he reminds me, and I'm, I'm hesitant, listeners of this show know, I'm hesitant to do player comps because I don't want to give people the wrong idea of who a prospect is. But he reminds me of Jason Hayward as far as high on base percentage, uh, good defender with a plus arm, hits the ball hard, but just doesn't rack up a ton of home runs. And it sounds like he took, when Freddie dropped the Babbitt curse last year, it sounds like Michael Harris kind of picked it up. You always got to have somebody stuck with the curse. But he just, his profile reminds me a lot of like that, that uh, first or second year Jason Hayward of, you know, 110, 114 to exit velo, but it's a line drive into the gap and he's taken two, maybe stretch into three versus crushing home runs under the short porch and, and right. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the Jason Hayward comp a little bit. Um, I'll be honest, I wasn't much into prospects at that time, so I don't really remember you know, what Hayward was like at the minor league level. Obviously, at the major league level, he became a ground ball machine to second base. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't necessarily see that happening for, for Harris, but that left-handed you know, swing, uh, again, I, I can see some of the comparisons there. Uh, I do think he'll be a very good defensive outfielder. You know, everybody that I've heard or talked to watching Michael Harris said that he can be every bit as good as Christian Pache. You know, obviously Pache gets the the highest marks for defense in the Braves system. Uh, but from what I hear, Michael Harris is right behind him and will be second on that list. So I think he's going to be a very good defensive player. Again, if the power doesn't come, I see him being a, a 280 you know, 350 type of player um, getting on base a lot. Like you said, still having a very good hit tool, being able to steal 20 bags. So even if the power doesn't come, we're talking about a very good major league player in my mind. Yeah. And we, we teased it earlier, but in just a second, I want to talk about those catchers that those big two catchers, but first uh, I know there's less football being played right now, but betonline.net has a ton of stuff to bet on this playoff season. I mean, you can do points scored, player performance props, where fired coaches are going. You can bet on the Brazilian presidential election right now. I mean, BetOnline is the number one spot for all things betting in 2022. Uh, not just football, that's what everybody thinks about with the big game coming up, but basketball, hockey, boxing, UFC. I mean, their odds coverage is the best in the business. BetOnline is your fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports and play your favorite games because BetOnline is where the game starts. Yep. So... We've both touched on it a bit, but Shea Langoliers and William Contreras, uh, the two big catchers for the Braves, obviously one of them has the pedigree of being a Contreras. His brother, Wilson, plays for the Cubs as of now. There's been rumors they want to move him as well. Shea Langoliers, the, the, the high draft pick that you, that you come in. Uh, most people now have Langoliers rated above Contreras. Um, as somebody who kind of pays a lot of attention to this system, kind of push on the spot a bit. Do you think that that's probably the right ranking or is it they're so close it doesn't necessarily matter? Yeah, no, I, I definitely like Shea Langoliers better overall. I think he's just a more well-rounded player. Um, obviously, everybody knows he's great defensively, but I think he's also going to be a, a 250 hitter that gives you 25 home runs, 20 to 25-ish home runs which you'll take from your catcher for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I like Langoliers overall. I just think he's the more well-rounded, polished player, obviously, you know, college player coming out of Baylor. And that's no slight at Contreras, who I think will be a really good hitter. I just think he has 
a long way to go defensively. Um, so I would put Langoliers ahead of, of, of Contreras at this point. And I know everybody's talking about wanting to trade. You know, William Contreras could be the odd man out in trade talks. You know, that definitely could happen. And, you know, I, I would understand it. For me, it would have to be for a big piece. I wouldn't just trade them because you have Langoliers there, there and you have them ranked ahead. You know, catchers, good catchers are hard to come by. And I think the Braves have two really good young ones in Langoliers and Contreras. There's nothing wrong with holding on to both of them. But if, you know, the Braves find a trade package for a frontline starter or a, a big outfield bat and the other team, you know, prioritizes Contreras in that trade, I wouldn't hesitate to move him. And I don't think the Braves would either. Yeah, and and that kind of seems most likely to me is you keep both guys, and I guess right now you have Langoliers at AAA, you have Contreras, I would assume, at AA because you do have uh, Travis Darno has been re-signed. You have him for, for a little bit of time in Atlanta, so you would think you have a bit of runway to, to, to get Langoliers into the job. You want Contreras around, but like you said, if there's a, a chance to go out and get a, a number two starter, there's a chance to go out and get you know, a big outfield bat that can count on you. Or if for some reason Freddie Freeman goes somewhere else and you need to replace that, I know you don't want to speak it into existence. <laughs> the thing that I worry about is the the corner infield in the farm for Atlanta is it's it's bare. The only real, I mean, the somewhat promising prospect you really had at, at, at first was Bryce Ball when you saw him get moved in the Jock Peterson deal. And so if... If Freddie Freeman, for some reason, does not come back to Atlanta, uh, you have to make a move to to replace him. And I think maybe that's where Contreras' value goes, as well as one of those outfielders like we talked about, because you've got the three between Pache, Waters, and Harris. If you have to make a move, I think that's where you you need to spend some prospect capital to try to go out and replace Freddie Freeman. Yeah, look, if Freddie Freeman goes elsewhere, the only move for the Braves is to get Olsen. I mean, that's really all there is to it. They have two options. You're not going to replace Freddie Freeman, but your best shot at doing that is Matt Olsen. Um, so, you know, I, I understand that, and, and I don't like the other option either that some people will say, well, go get Chris Bryant and move Austin Riley to, to first base. I'm not messing with Austin Riley right now. He, he has proven that he can play at the hot corner and play really good defense. Obviously, the offense came along last year. I would not mess with him. I'm not touching him at this at the moment. So for me, it's it's re-sign Freddie Freeman, which I believe will happen. If not, you you got to get Matt Olson. Um, and to do that, if I'm the A's, I don't make a trade with the Braves unless Michael Harris or Shea Langoliers is in that trade because Matt Olson's one of the best first basemen in baseball. You know, he's under team control for two more years at a, a pretty decent price, most likely 12 million and maybe 15 million the following year. So if, if I'm the A's and the Braves come calling, I'm saying I got to have Michael Harris or Shea Langoliers. You know, maybe you can get a, a package of three prospects. I know you had mentioned beforehand, maybe like Contreras and, and Vodnik and either Pache or Waters. Look, if I'm the Braves I, I and you don't get Freddie Freeman, I do that in a heartbeat. You know, yeah. Um, but I, if I'm the A's, I, I want more than that. If I'm going to give up Matt Olson, knowing the Braves are out of options, <laughs> you know, they're they're, simply, they're they're pretty much out of options. I mean, that if Freddie Freeman goes elsewhere, that paints the Braves in a really bad corner, and the A's would know that. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm hoping it doesn't happen, but you know, if it does, you know, I think the Braves have the prospects to get it done, but. For me, again, if I'm the A's, I, I got to have Harris or Langoliers in that package. Absolutely. And and kind of last thing for you here is looking at the Braves pitching prospects. There's a lot of guys, and it looks like there's one or maybe at best two rotation spots open. And so, you know, who seizes that fifth spot? Is it is it Kyle Muller? Is it Tucker Davidson? Is it Tuki Toussaint? Like, how do you figure out that fifth spot? Because the issue that I think I've noticed, and you saw this with the Bryce Wilson deal where they traded up to the Pirates last year, is Atlanta does not have the runway to let a guy try to figure it out every five days in Atlanta. And some of these guys, I feel like, like a Kyle Wright, you know, have great pedigrees, you know, Vandy boy, just like Dansby Swanson, and pitch well. And the first time that they struggle, 
they're back on the train to Gwinnett. <coughs> and so, yeah, and that's and that's my that's what I've been talking about for a while now. You know, really since nineteen. I mean, eighteen wasn't expected. <laughs> um, you know, nineteen. Still, you were kind of in that. Okay, we're ahead of the the curve here. But once you got to twenty twenty, the Braves didn't have time for these prospects to figure it out. Um, you know, and that I think that really hurt Bryce Wilson, which you mentioned. I think that's hurt Sean Newcomb, Tuki Toussaint, and Kyle Wright. Where you know you're in a pennant race, especially last year when they fell behind and were and were trying to come back. They didn't have time for these guys to figure it out at the big league level. You need guys that are going to come in. You know, like Waskari Noah last year, he came in and he produced right away and he had a, a great run there. And that's what the Braves need. You know, you get three or four starts to kind of maybe figure it out. And if you're not showing improvement, you know, you got to go and we got to find somebody who can. So, you know, that's why they haven't had time for a Sean Newcomb to really get an extended look as a starter or a Tuki Tucson because they're just so inconsistent. Um, but you talk about who's going to take that fifth starter spot and uh, they may need more spots than that. Cause we don't know how Charlie Morton is going to be, you know, coming back from his injury to start the year. Obviously we don't know what's going to happen with Mike Soroka, but I think Kyle Wright is the guy. Again, I think this is his, his year. I mean, to make or break, whatever it's going to be, this is Kyle Wright's year to prove it. Had that great start in the world series was great at triple a in 2021 you know, this has got to be it for him. And as long as he comes in spring training and shows what he did in the, in the World Series, showed what he did at, at AAA last year, continues to be aggressive in zone, trusting his stuff, I think he'll win that job out of spring training, and then it'll be up to him to be consistent with it. You know, we've seen it with Kyle Wright at times. He just has to be more consistent start to start, and I think he's the one that that takes that job. Great stuff, Jake. If, if folks want – more info about you and about the show, where can they go in to, to find you, to follow you and get all of that? Yeah, please make sure you do go over and follow us on uh, Locked on Braves, uh, the podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Locked on underscore Braves. Make sure you get that underscore in there. You can follow me on Twitter at Shortstop Ball, as it says right down there. Uh, but yeah, please do go subscribe to the podcast. I'm on YouTube as well at Locked on Braves, but you can also just go out and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast at Locked on Braves. And I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. And as always, if you have questions, we do mailbags every Monday. Locked on MLB Prospects at gmail.com. Stay tuned the rest of the week. We've got... Locked on Royals to come and talk some Bobby Witt Jr. We got somebody mad. He's not number one overall prospect. And then Friday, we're doing our farm Friday. We're covering the entire National League East. But until then, this has been Locked on MLB Prospects. <laughs>